But Tolkien himself has always fascinated me ever since I had the privilege of attending his lectures in English at Oxford. Dennis Geralt talked to Tolkien about his writing and his work about how this epic mythology was created in the mind of a professor of English language. Long before I wrote The Hobbit and long before I wrote this, they had constructed this well mythology. So you had some sort of scheme on which it was possible to work? Well, it meant sagas, yes. Well, as soon as they got, it got sucked into it, as The Hobbit did itself. You see, The Hobbit was originally not you know, about his door, but as soon as it got moving out into the world, it, it got moved, it sucked into it. So your characters and your story really took, took charge? I say took charge. I don't mean that you were completely under their spell or anything of this sort. Oh, no, 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 no. no. I don't walk about uh, dreaming at all, no. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't, uh, an obsession anyway. You have a sensation that, um, but at this point, A, B, C, D, only A, one of them is right, and you've got to wait till you see. Of course, I had maps, because you mu if you're going to have a complicated story, you must work to a map, otherwise you never make a map of it afterwards. The moons, I think, finally, were, the moons and suns have worked out according to what they were in this part of the world in 1942, actually. They must have something where they... You began in 42, did you to write it? No, I began in 32, as soon as the Hobbit was out, in the 30s, yeah. It was finally finished just before it was published, I wrote the draft before. before. about 1949, I think, I remember, I actually wept at the denouement, but uh, then, of course, it was a tremendous re revision. I typed the whole that work out twice, and lots of it many times, on a bed in an attic. Well, they couldn't afford the, um, of course, the typing. There's some mistakes, too. And also, what I, amuses me to say, was I suppose I'm in a position which it doesn't matter what people think of me now. Some vital mistakes in grammar from a professor of English language literature was rather shocking. Yeah. I haven't that study. There was one where I used this code as a past pass of the stride. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of things like that, yeah. Do you feel any sense of guilt at all that as a philologist, as a professor of English language, with which you were concerned with the factual sources of language, you devoted a large part of your life to a fictional thing? No, no, actually, it doesn't make me look good. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I... No, no, there's quite a lot of linguistic wisdom in it. I don't feel any guilt complex about the Lord of the Rings. Have you a particular fondness for these comfortable, homely things of life that the Shire embodies? The, you know, home and pipe and fire and bed, the homely virtues. And haven't you? <laughs> haven't you, Professor? Yes, of course. Yes, 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 yes. You have a particular fondness yes, yes. for hobbits. That's why I feel, in, I feel at home. I, look, the Shire is very like the kind of world in which I first became aware of things. Very like. Which was perhaps more poignant to me because I wasn't born in it. I was born in Bloomfontein, South Africa. So I was very young when I got back, but at the same time, it bites into your memory and imagination, even if you, even if you don't think it has. If your first Christmas tree is a wilting eucalyptus, and if you're normally troubled by heat and sand, then to have just at the edge of your imagination is opening up, suddenly find yourself in a quiet Warwickshire village. I think it engenders a particular love of, of what you might call central Midland... Uh, English countryside based on good water stones and elm trees and small, quiet rivers and so on. And, of course, sort of rustic people about. At what age did you come to England? I was opposed when I was landing about three and a half. Pretty poignant, of course, because you see, one of the things why people say they don't remember is because the, it's like constantly photographing the same thing on the same plate. Slight changes simply make a blur. But if a child had a sudden break like that, uh, it's conscious. What it tries to do is to... Um, fit the new memories onto the old. I've got a perfectly clear, vivid picture of a house, but I now know that it's a beautifully worked out pastiche of my own home in Bloomfordian and my grandmother's house in Birmingham. Because I can still remember going down the road in Birmingham and wondering what had happened to the gallery, what had happened to the balcony. So constantly I do remember things extremely early. I can remember bathing in the Indian Ocean when I was not quite two and I remember it very clearly. Frodo accepts the burden of the ring yeah. and he embodies, as a character, the virtues of long-suffering and perseverance, and by his actions, one might almost say, in the Buddhist sense, he acquires merit. He becomes, in fact, almost a Christ figure. Why did you choose a halfling, a hobbit, for this role? I didn't. I didn't do much choosing. I wrote the hobbit choosing. All I was trying to do in the role was to carry on from the point where the, where the hobbit left off. 
Whatever I got hobbits on my hand, didn't they? Indeed, but there's nothing particularly Christ-like about Bilbo. Oh, no. No? Yeah. But in the face of the most appalling danger, he struggles on and continues, and, and wins through. But that seems... Well, I thought he was more like an adequate human race. I've always been impressed. We are here surviving because of the indomitable courage of quite small people against impossible odds, jungles, volcanoes, wild beasts. They struggle on, almost blindly in a way. I thought that conceivably Midgard might be Middle Earth or have some connection. Oh, yes, they're the same word. Most people have made this mistake in thinking Middle Earth is this particular kind of Earth or is another planet and, uh, you know, in the science fiction sort, but it's simply an old-fashioned word for, the, for this world we live in, as imagined surrounded by the ocean. It seemed to me that, that Middle Earth was, was, in a sense, as you say, this world we live in, but um, this world we live in at a different era. Well, no, at a different stage of imagination, yes. Did you intend, in the Lord of the Rings, that certain races should embody certain principles, the elves' wisdom, the dwarfs' craftsmanship, men, husbandry, and battle, and so forth? Didn't intend it, but when you've uh, got these people on your hands, you've got to make them different, haven't you? Well, of course, as we all know, ultimately, we've only got, uh, only got humanity to work with. It's the only clay we've got. We should all, or at least a uh, large part of the human race, would like to uh, have greater power of mind, greater power of art, by which I mean that the gap between uh, the conception and the power of execution should be shortened. We should like that, and we should like, of course, longer time, if not indefinite time, which to, to go on knowing more and do, making more. Well, therefore, we make the elves uh, immortal in a sense. I had to use immortal, but I didn't mean that they were eternally immortal, but merely that they are very longevity and their longevity probably last as long as the inhabitability of the earth. The dwarves, of course, quite obviously, uh, couldn't you say in many ways they remind you of the Jews? All their words are Semitic, obviously, and constructed be Semitic. The hobbits are just, well, rustic English people, made small in size because it reflects the uh, general small reach of their imagination, but not the small reach of their courage or latent power. This seems to me one of the great strengths of the book, amid this enormous conglomeration of names. One doesn't get lost. At well, least after the first reading, after the second reading of the book. Well, it doesn't need an extra. I'm very glad you told me that, because I gave a great deal of trouble. Well, you were the master, you see. Also, of course, it gives me great pleasure. A good name. I always, in the writing, always start with a name. Give me a name and it produces a story, not the other way about, normally. Of the languages you know, which were the greatest help to you in writing The Lord of the Rings? Oh, no. Yes. No, I do, well, I'll be sort of modern name. I should have said that... Uh, well, she was always attracted to be uh, by its style and sound more than any other. Even though I first time I saw it on coal trucks, I always wanted to know what it was about. It seems to me, certainly, that, that um, the music of Welsh comes through in the names you've chosen for mountains and for mm. places in general. Yes. Do you acknowledge this? Yes. yes. Very much. But a, a much rarer, but very potent. Uh, in front of myself, it's been finished. Is the book to be considered as an allegory? No. I just like allegory whenever I smell it. Do you consider the world declining as the third age declines in your book? And do you see a fourth age for the world at the moment? Our world? Well, the person of my age, you see, is exactly the kind of person who's uh, lived uh, through one of the most quickly changing periods of uh, narrative history. Surely never been in 70 years so much change. There's an autumnal quality throughout the whole of The Lord of the Rings. You, in one case, um, a character says the story is continuing, but I seem to have dropped out of it. Yes. Um, however, everything is declining and it's fading, at least towards the end of the Third Age. Every choice tends to the upsetting of some tradition. Now, this seems to me to be somewhat like Tennyson's The Old Order Changeth, Yielding Place to New, and God Fulfills Himself in Many Ways. Where is God in the Lord of the Rings? He mentioned once or twice. Is he the one about the Elder? The one, yeah. The one, yeah. Are you, in fact, a theist? Oh, I'm a, I'm a Roman Catholic. Devout Roman Catholic, yes. Do you wish to be remembered chiefly by your writings on philology, on other, other matters, or by the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit? I shouldn't say there's no much choice in the band at all. It'd be by the Lord of the Rings, I'd take it. it wouldn't it be rather like Case of Longfellow, wouldn't it? They remember, people remember the Longfellow wrote Hiawatha and perhaps one do it. They quite forget he was a professor of modern languages.